Hi, my name is Leanne Dahl and this is Kelly Cruz. And we would like to invite all of Christ's community to our current show in the gallery downtown. Yeah, this exhibit is called We Are Still Watching and it's by Fort Collins based artist Louise Cutler. This show deals with injustice in general, but also looks at several specific cases of injustice in historic events. Louise has also taken individual stories of many people who fought against injustice in these specific historic cases, often at a great personal cost, and she's connected them beautifully to the scripture in Hebrews about the great cloud of witnesses. So we invite you to come in and experience their stories to let them witnessed to you and we hope that you will leave this exhibit not only learning more about people in our history who have fought for justice but also with a newly ignited passion in your heart for what God is passionate about which is justice. So again, we want to invite you to come but to bring your family. We want you to bring friends because the language of art opens the shutters of people's hearts. God is a creator and he has made us in that image. We look forward to seeing you in January and February. Hello, Christ community. My name is Adrienne Aursler and I'd like to welcome you to the Brookside online service. If this is your first time attending with us, please go online to our website and fill out a connect card where we can better know how to serve you during this time. We also have on that same link prayer cards that you can fill out. We as a staff pray for our congregation each week, and we'd love to know how to serve you and pray for you the best way we can. And now I'd like to tell you about an upcoming opportunity to do joy bags. We want to invite you to participate in our joy bag service project on February 7th from 10 a.m. to 1230 p.m. This event will take place in the alley so we can maintain social distancing. You can either put together a bag as you leave church that day, or if you're attending our virtual service, come to the church during that time frame to assemble your bag. Each family can put together a bag of joy, which is filled with treats to share encouragement and joy with someone who needs it. Maybe a neighbor, a grocery checker, or whomever God places on your heart. And now let's begin to worship together. to your voice I'm learning to listen 
in my ears I want to hear you speak Tell me your thoughts What's on your mind I'll be your friend I want to see through your eyes I want to see through your eyes I want to see through your eyes I'm not in a hurry When it comes to your spirit When it comes to your prayer
Well, good morning and welcome to the Brookside Campus of Christ Community online service. We're so glad that you're joining us wherever you're watching from. And in a minute, we're going to hear our scripture text for this morning read and, and have a time of teaching. But before we do that, I just want to say thank you again for, for being here. We're so glad that you're with us. And, and we would actually love to know that you are with us this morning. Recently, we've developed a, a way for, for you to, to let us know that you're, you're watching wherever you're watching from. So if you text uh, just the letters BKS to, to the number 913-286-1113. Again, that's BKS to 913-286-1113. If you just text that, it'll pop up a link to a form, and, and you can say on that form that you're, you're watching and, and who's watching with you and, and any prayer requests that you, that you have. And actually, every week, uh, we've been doing this past couple weeks, we're going to draw a, a winner from the people who texted in. Uh, and if you live locally in the KC area and, and we draw your name, we'll, we'll bring you a, a dinner on us uh, from Brookside Poultry. Uh, so congratulations last week to the Carlson, to the Carlson family uh, for winning that. And, and we'd, we, again, we'd love to know you're with us. So, um, so please text that in so that, we, so that we know that you're here. Uh, and, and with that, uh, let's go ahead and hear the, the scripture reading read for us. Hi, my name is Shannon Yates, and I'm doing this week's scripture reading. Luke 19, 11 through 27. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them in parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you put my money on deposit so that when I come back, I, have, I could have collected interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I'm going to be brutally honest with you this morning. Uh, this week has been one of the hardest weeks of my life. It's one of those weeks where everything just seems to take twice as much uh, effort as, as it should, right? Where, where, where each mundane and, and ordinary activity uh, is colored by an underlying uh, gloom and, and sadness. Uh, at times this week, I found myself unable to sleep. Uh, my mind was just racing. Uh, other times, I would just zone out of a conversation, uh, distracted, thinking about other things. Uh, sometimes I just started tearing up out of nowhere. And maybe you've had weeks like this, uh, but if I can just be vulnerable with you for a moment, uh, it all comes down to, to one moment that, that defined uh, what my week was like last week. It was fourth down and goal on the eight-yard line. There were just 
over two minutes left, and the MVP of the league was at the helm of the offense. And Packers head coach Matt LaFleur decided to kick a field goal. You may have seen it. Instead of taking a shot to tie up the game with a touchdown, he gave the ball back to the most accomplished quarterback in NFL history, uh, who, by the way, has kind of a penchant for getting lucky calls to bounce his way, and put the entire game in the hands of the shaky Packer defense. It was devastating. Now, I'm not going to turn your nice morning at church into the rantings of a devastated Packers fan. And if you don't care about sports, the words I just said were meaningless to you anyway. But there are a lot of reasons that the, that the Packers lost this Sunday. There were missed opportunities, terrible defensive schemes, dropped passes, so on. But so many sports games are remembered for the decisions coaches make at key moments. In fact, being a coach in any sport is all about making the right decision at the right moment. It's all about taking risks when risks need to be taken and playing safe when it makes sense. It's all about making the call that has the greatest chance to yield the greatest reward. And Coach LaFleur has been all over the sports talk shows this week as people dissect his decision. Did he play it safe when he should have taken a risk in Aaron Rodgers? Or did he take simply the wrong risk? It was risky, but it was the wrong risk at the wrong time. Maybe would we look at things differently if his decision had worked and he was rewarded with a win? And ultimately, we know when we watch sports that none of the decisions that coaches make are certain until they play out on the field. That's why there's always a risk involved. There's always a chance that that things go the wrong way, even when the right decision is made. I mean, when you boil it down, the job of a coach is, is simply a game of calculated risk and reward. Now, this risk reward dilemma, it's not only a sports phenomenon. In fact, risk is an inescapable part of each one of our lives. If you you think back just to the decisions you've made, even in this last week, we we intuitively weigh the the potential risks and the possible reward of of each decision we make, don't we? Whether it's it's going into an entrepreneurial endeavor or or our strategy for our retirement portfolio or, or even just simply the choice of how we spend our Friday night. We're constantly considering the risk involved and the potential gain from taking that risk. But ironically, the the greatest risk to to a business enterprise or an investment portfolio or or to our, our very lives may well be to avoid risk itself. In fact, our our greatest peril may not be taking too much risk, but rather being unwilling to take enough risk. When it comes to the risk in our relationships, in our our daily work, and, and yes, even in our spiritual growth, the greatest danger we face may well be to play it too safe. We're in a series right now as a church that we're calling Rediscovering Jesus' Kingdom. And in this series, we're exploring how the gospel writer Luke, the great historian, pictures Jesus as the king that Israel was waiting for and expecting. So in this series, we're really looking to understand what kind of a king Jesus is and what it looks like when he is king of the world and his lives. And as a result, we're also looking at what it means to be his subjects, to his servants, to live under his rule in his kingdom. And what Jesus highlights in the passage of scripture that we just heard read is that risk is, the, is a necessary part of his kingdom. Risk is necessary to be a part of his rule. In Jesus' eyes, as we will see, life in the kingdom is always risky business. Life in the kingdom is always risky business. 
Now, we're continuing this, this journey in the Gospel of Luke, and if you haven't already, I uh, invite you to open your Bible to, to Luke chapter 19 and, and, and follow along with us. Uh, Jesus and his followers at this point are just on the cusp of arriving at Jerusalem. They've been journeying to Jerusalem for, for a good chunk of, of, of Luke's Gospel, and they're finally approaching their, their long-awaited destination. And and at this moment, his followers are feeling the the anticipation of of something big that they they feel like is about to happen. See, as they walk into Jerusalem, they're expecting Jesus right then and there to be crowned as king, to to reclaim power to the nation of Israel, to to defeat the enemies of God's people as they'd been waiting for for so, so long. And Luke sets the scene in this way for us in in verse 11 of chapter 19. Read with me. He says, As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Now, now what does that mean? It it means that the people traveling with Jesus, as well as the crowds who who had just seen him declare that, that, that salvation had come to the household of this tax collector, Zacchaeus, as we looked at last week, they they were primed to believe that Jesus was going to show himself to be the militant Messiah that they had hoped for. But kind of like, you know, when a, when a kid is, is super excited for something and you, you have to make sure that you, you, you have, make sure that they have the right expectations or else they're going to be like super bummed out when they find out it's not what they had been making it out to be in their minds. Uh, Luke explains that Jesus tells this parable to, to dampen their enthusiasm just a little bit. And he wants to correct their misunderstanding of what it looks like for him to be king. Now, the story he tells to, 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 to have this effect on them goes a little bit like this. Read with me. It says, A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. So calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minus and said to them, Engage in business until I come. So, so the story starts out. There, there's a man uh, who, who goes away uh, in order to become king. And once he becomes king, whatever he has to do, I don't know, he has to fight a dragon or, or just oust the, the current king. I don't know what he has to do for that. But once he, he does that, he's going to come back uh, as the king and rule this newly acquired kingdom. That's the, the, the scenario. Uh, and before he goes away to do whatever it is to become king, he assembles his servants, the people who, who support him, who want him to be king, his, his friends. And he gives them a task when he's gone, just a simple task. He actually gives them each money. Uh, each of the ten servants gets one mina, uh, which was a, a, a unit of measurement, a, a, some currency uh, in that day that was equivalent to about 100 days of wages, so around three months of uh, salary. And he orders them to use that money that he had just given them, the mina, to engage in business on his behalf until he comes back. So I'm going away to become king. You here, take this money, do something with it. That's, that's the, the goal. Engage in business on my behalf. Now, like every story of every person who has ever come to power ever, uh, there are people who aren't a fan of this guy becoming king. Here's how Jesus continues in verse 14. It says, But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. So this nobleman who's trying to become king is actually facing great hostility. In fact, the majority of people in his, in his quest to become king are, 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 are creating a plan to, to reject the legitimacy of his kingship. They don't want him to be the one who rules over them. There's hostility. But nevertheless... He ends up succeeding at whatever it is that gets him to become king. And he returns having received a kingdom to rule. So he's successful in his mission to become king. And when he gets back, uh, he, he does what you would expect him to do. He, he wants to hear how his servants have done with the task that they gave him. How have, how have they, they gone about that mission of, of, of engaging in business in his absence? So he calls them in one by one. He's just sitting at his desk or in his office or on his throne or whatever he's sitting on. Calls them in one by one and, and here's what happens. Luke tells us, The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas 
more. So he invested it, and it turned a profit of ten times the amount he invested. And he said to him, the, the, the king said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. So the first guy, he does a great job. He, he took the mina and apparently did a lot of business uh, while he was gone because he made a profit of ten Minus. And the king applauds his faithfulness and his obedience to the mission. So he rewards him. He gives him responsibility in his kingdom, authority over cities. He's a part of what the king is doing in this new kingdom. Then the next person comes in. Let's keep reading. The second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. Now, the second guy doesn't get quite the, the rave reviews that the first guy gets, but it appears that the king is just as pleased with his faithfulness to the mission he gave him. Even though he made less profit with the money, he gives him authority and greater responsibility in his kingdom. So, so both of these servants so far, even though the amount of their gain from the business they had done was, was different, are equally lauded for their, their faithfulness to the king. They did what he asked them to do on his behalf, and they're both rewarded with responsibility and authority in this new kingdom. But then the third guy comes, and here's what he says. He says, another came asking, Lord, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. So unlike the first two, the third servant didn't do anything with the money that the king gave him. Instead, he, he kept it in a handkerchief for safekeeping. And he outright tells us and tells the king the reason he does this. It's because he was afraid. He was afraid of his master. He, he, he thought that the, that the master was a severe man. And he was afraid that he would either like, get mad at him if he lost the mina somehow or take anything that he gained from investing the mina anyway. He was afraid of the severity, that he'd, he'd take things from him and punish him if he made a mistake. Now, now keeping a money away like this in a handkerchief or underground was, was actually a common practice in, in Jesus' day. Well, today, we think of burying money as something that people like, like Ron Swanson do because they don't trust banks. Uh, but, but many of Jesus' hearers might have even thought this was a wise thing for the servant to do. And that's all fine and good to, to stow away money if the master hadn't told him specifically to do something with it. See, the master had ordered him to do something with the money. But because he was afraid, he directly disobeyed that order and kept it hidden away. And here's the master's response. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. He's angry. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. That's what you, you thought of me? Well, if that's true, then, then why did, did you not put my money at least in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Now notice, the king doesn't agree with the servant's assessment of his character. He doesn't say, you're right, I'm a severe man and I would have punished you. But he does use the servant's perspective against him. In other words, he's like, even if, even if I was a severe man, if that truly was the case, which clearly isn't true because he didn't take the money from the other guys, if that's really what you thought, don't you think I'd be mad that you didn't obey my instructions and do business with the money? And if you think that I would have punished you for, for losing the money or for not getting me anything as a result, couldn't you have least have put it in the bank so I would have gained something from it? And it turns out, in fact, that, that it's precisely because the servant didn't risk anything with the money that the, the master shows his sternness in judgment. A little severity does come out. Here's how he responds. He says to the people who stood by, who were apparently watching this whole thing go down, he said, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, Lord, 
He has 10 minus. That seems a little unfair. And the king said, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, the ones who opposed him, who didn't even want him to be king in the first place, uh, who didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. They oppose my reign. That's what they deserve. Now, it's worth making a distinction here that the third servant doesn't receive or deserve the same punishment as the people who actively oppose the king. There's a distinction there. There's a a level of, of faithfulness, opposition, and then this third servant in the middle. But what does happen as punishment for for not doing what the master asked him to do is that he loses what he was given. And unlike the other servants, he receives no responsibility in this new kingdom. And that's how Jesus' story goes. Now, what do we make of this parable? Why does Jesus tell this story of a man who goes away, returns as king, assesses the faithfulness of his servants? What's his, his goal in this Well, in part, as we've already mentioned a little bit, he's telling this parable to explain what he's doing at that very moment as God's chosen king. He doesn't deny that he's God's chosen king, but as he approaches Jerusalem, uh, he he actually affirms he is God's king coming to God's people. And, And the people of Israel, for the most part, as he's been away, have not been faithful to him. They haven't taken all the things that God had given them as his special and treasured people and used them to engage in the business that God cares about. So Jesus is the king coming back and reckoning with Israel. They haven't been faithful in his absence. In part, he's also preparing his disciples for what's coming for them. Remember, their hearts are are beating with expectation as they approach Jerusalem. They're envisioning King Jesus soon to be seated on the throne of Israel with a kingly crown and them all sitting by his side. But Jesus knew otherwise. Jesus knew his followers were in for a long wait before the full kingdom they expected was here. So through this parable, Jesus was preparing his disciples for a time when their king would be gone and they'd be asked to engage in his business, to do his work while he's gone in his absence. And then he's going to come back, he says, and assess how they've done in that mission, just like the king in the story. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the main things Jesus wants his disciples to understand for that period of time before he comes back to them is that life in the kingdom is always risky business. Life in the kingdom is always risky business while Jesus is gone. And we live in that same time period today that that the disciples were being prepared for. So, So that same idea applies to us that life in the kingdom is always risky business. He wants us to know that too. Now, before we unpack this idea, I, I, I just so you know, I did my due diligence as a pastor and I tried to find a picture of Tom Cruise dancing in his underwear that didn't show Tom Cruise actually in his underwear. Uh, so, but I couldn't, so just pretend that that's on the screen right now. I did my di- due diligence. We're talking about risky business. But in our time remaining, I, I just want to take some time to ask this question. That according to this parable that Jesus tells, What does this risky kingdom business look like? What what does Jesus mean when he's highlighting the the riskiness of the business of his kingdom? Why is it risky? Both for his disciples and for us today. And here's the first thing that we can see in this parable that, that risky kingdom business looks like. The first thing is, it looks like associating your life with the king. Associating your life with the king. Jesus makes it clear that that those who are faithful to him, uh, the servants who who do what he asked them to do, are doing so in a hostile environment, right? In In the parable, most people are rejecting his kingship. But even in the midst of all of that hostility and opposition, he wants his his servants to associate their lives with this hated king while he's gone. 
In verse 15, it says that he came back to to assess what they had gained. Now, this is the only time that this Greek word translated what they had gained uh, appears in the New Testament. And its primary meaning is is how much business have you transacted? So it's not about how much profit you've made, but how much of my business have you actually done? The king is not trying to see who made the biggest profit, but, but just who was faithful to him in this hostile environment, who actually took the risk of publicly declaring their loyalty to him by engaging in his business with his money. Kenneth Bailey, who's, who's a, just a brilliant, brilliant thinker and writer, describes this dynamic in a really helpful way. Here's what he says. He says that the, that the question of the, the king is are you willing to take the risk and openly declare yourselves to be my servants during my absence in a world where so many oppose me and my rule? Once I return, having received kingly power, it will be easy to declare yourself as my loyal servants. But I am more interested in how you conduct yourselves when I'm absent, and you have to pay a high price to openly identify yourself with me. See, the the, the chief aim of this king is for his servants to to live out their allegiance to him with courage in the middle of a hostile environment. The expectation of the the minas that he he gives out is that they would be stewarded publicly and productively. I mean, it's kind of like if you could just picture this next two weeks, if if I was standing out in the parking lot of of Arrowhead Stadium in the middle of all these people who hate Tom Brady and hate the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I was trying to sell Bucks gear, right? You could just imagine what that would look like. It would not end well for me. I think I would be in the slaughterhouse division at that point in this parable. And this is where the third servant fell short. There's even a chance that he was thinking one of the reasons that he he kept the the mina away and didn't do anything with it is like, hey, if I sit on it and he returns, I won't have lost his money and I think he's a pretty mean guy. But also, maybe he won't be successful in becoming king. Maybe he won't actually come back and I won't have anything to lose by being associated with him. Because if someone goes away who's hated to try to become king and you are for this guy, and then this guy doesn't become king, there's probably a target on your back. Like maybe he delayed in engaging any business because he didn't trust that the man would actually return as king. And friends, I think that we have the same challenge of risking our association of our lives with Jesus today. Because how many people today in our world, even just thinking in America, would say about Jesus, we don't want this guy to rule over us, right? And how many of us in that, in that environment would Jesus say, it, it will be easy to declare yourself loyal to me when I return, but are you willing to do it while I'm away and people reject my rule? And can I just suggest that that maybe some of us this morning are sort of hedging our bets with faith in Jesus? In the gambling world, when you bet on something, you have opportunities to to hedge your bet, to make sure all your bases are covered so you minimize as much risk as possible. Now, I'm not going to give you a gambling lesson in church, uh, but maybe we're hedging our bets in that way. We're minimizing our risk of associating with Jesus. Some of us might have even come to faith in Jesus kind of out of, I want to make sure that that eternal life basis is covered. So yes, we're we're associated with him, but quietly. That way we don't look like fools if it ever turned out to not be true. Maybe some of us think maybe he won't come back and I won't have, have put myself in danger. Play it safe with our lives. And if I can be frank, I think that for some of us, we might be more eager to identify with a popular cause than for the cause of Christ. Like we might support certain causes or things we believe in in our conversations with friends or on social media, but how often do we connect those things to our Christian faith? In fact, we might even be hesitant to to mention our faith to others in those situations or or be quick to backtrack if it ever comes up for fear of of causing offense or feeling too overbearing with what we think. 
I mean, personally, I'm guilty, I don't know if any of you do this, of, of, of when I'm reading a Christian book in a coffee shop, or I have a stack of them next to me, I'll like turn the title away so they can't be read just because I don't even want to invite any of that kind of stuff, which is like ridiculous, but I do it. And I think part of the risk involved that Jesus is highlighting here in being in his kingdom and, and acknowledging him as king is going public with our affirmation of him as the king of the world, making it a clear part of, of who we are. And maybe the next step you need to take in, in, in stepping into that risk of Jesus' kingdom is going more public with your faith whether it's connecting it to things you say on social media or, or in personal conversations or at work or at, at school. Maybe it's simply by praying for other people. I had a conversation last year throughout COVID with a woman who works in our congregation who, who is a nurse and, and just said that, that she, was, she would started praying over people at work, just asking if they, if they were okay with, with being prayed for. And she saw God move in incredible ways in those people and often when I've asked people if I can pray for them that don't believe in Jesus, I hardly ever get the answer no. So maybe that's one way that, that, that you, can, you can make yourself a little more public in your association with Jesus and engaging the business that he's called us to engage. The first risk of, of kingdom business is associating your life with the king. Here's the second. Stewarding your gifts from the king. Stewarding your gifts from the king. Risky kingdom business looks like stewarding the gifts that the king has given you. See, in this parable, the, the nobleman who's going away to become king, he distributes the gifts to, to the people, and he expects the gifts to be used, to be stewarded, to be shared, to be multiplied, to, to expand in, in their stewardship of this little bit of money. And the reason that the master is angry with the third servant is because he didn't give him the gift so he could just sit on it and do nothing with it. He gave it to him so it could be used and stewarded and multiplied. And those that, that use their gifts in this, in this parable are rewarded, right? That's the, that's the, the reward is that they're, they're rewarded. And it's important to clarify here, and there are so many Christian circles around the world that, that say that the reward of a faithful life is more comfort and ease in this life. And this parable flies directly in the face of that idea. That the reward that we get for being faithful and stewarding the gifts that God has given us is more responsibility, not more comfort. More responsibility in serving Jesus. So the people who, who actually steward their gifts, even with minimal profit, will be rewarded. But those who fail to use them at all for service to Jesus actually will have their gifts taken. That's what happens to the third service, their servant. And the, the, the taking of gifts, it's not so much a, a lack of a reward, but receiving what we both deserve and want. Like doing nothing what, with your gifts gives us what we want, which is nothing from our gifts. And part of the risk of, of the business of Jesus' kingdom is multiplying what you've been given. And that's risky because there's always a chance of failure, isn't it? There's always a chance of failure. But the picture that we get here is that the king would have been happy even if the last servant's mina had made just a few cents as long as he did something with it. So maybe what you need to do to step out into the risky business of Jesus' kingdom more is trust, seek out the trusted voices in your life and, and help identify what those gifts that you have are. What has God given you? that you can steward, not, not just the things that bring you joy, but the things that, that bless other people. Maybe in this moment you need to expand your list of gifts to include your, your time and, and the talents that you have and the, the treasures that you've been given. And if you're like me, a lot of times, maybe you've delayed in taking risks for the kingdom, sitting around on it in a handkerchief, because like the servant, you're concerned about the risk of failing of making mistakes, of maybe you step out and put yourself out there and you're rejected or you lose something along the way. I have so much of that fear a lot in my life. Or maybe just like the servant, you, you aren't convinced that Jesus is a generous rewarder. Maybe we think he's a severe judge and, and he'll punish me if I lose what he's given me, if I mess it up or make a mistake in any way. So it's better to not do anything altogether. 
But scholar Arlen Holtgren is so, so, so helpful here with his encouraging words uh, to those of us who are concerned about failure or punishment. Here's what he says. He says, when it comes to serving Christ, one should be bold and not be afraid of risks. The words of promise from Jesus inviting disciples into the joy of his kingdom are meant to be heard by all who do not worry too much about securing their own lives, playing it safe, but get on with lives of self-abandon and witness. Knowing that the grace of God in Christ will more than compensate for any mistakes they might make. See, friends, this parable, far from highlighting the severity of the king, highlights the generosity of the king. He isn't a severe man like the third servant thinks. He's a generous and even more merciful man. He rewards those who are faithful to him and steward his gifts well. Friends, he is not going to punish you for taking a risk and coming up short. All he wants you to do is to have the courage to step out in faith and use what he has given you for the mission of his kingdom and to anticipate a reward in the future that's far greater than anything we could lose now. So the risky business of the kingdom, it looks like associating your life with the king. It looks like stewarding the gifts from the king. And finally, it looks like conducting your work for the king. Conducting your work for the king. In verse 13, where we get the command from the master, the command literally says, engage in business until I come. And there's a Greek expression that's used here in ho that's translated as until, but it quite literally means in which. So, So literally, it could be translated engage in trade in a situation in which I'm coming back. That's why I really like the the NIV translation here that says, put this money to work. Put this money to work. Remember, the the emphasis is not about time and getting as much done as possible until he comes back. While while there's truth to that, that the focus here is on conducting business in such a way that Jesus is king and we are citizens in that kingdom. And everything we do, we work in such a way as Jesus is king and we are citizens of that kingdom. And friends, a large part of that kingdom living takes place where God has placed you to do his kingdom business the majority of your week, your vocational calling, paid or unpaid in your family and in your work. Here's how the Theology of Work commentary summarizes the point of this passage. It says, the point is that Jesus, is that acknowledging Jesus as king requires working toward his purposes in whatever field of work you do. Working toward his purposes in whatever field of work you do. So, friends, how are you working with the kingdom in mind in your Monday life? Both in the the paid work that you do and also in advancing the mission of other things that are important to Jesus' kingdom, like, like the risky efforts of evangelism and justice. How are you working with the kingdom in mind in your Monday life? If last fall you, you joined the, the online uh, live stream kind of conference, I guess video recorded conference of, of the common good, uh, you heard Andy Crouch, who's the leader of, of a ministry called Praxis, uh, share a story of, of a man who, or in a business who, who perfectly exemplified this. See, there was a man who, who took out on the risky endeavor of entrepreneurship in his business a few years ago. And, and when COVID hit last year, he, he realized that he owed a substantial sum of money to another company that he wasn't going to be able to pay and he was going to have to go out of business. And, and out of nowhere one day, the, the, the owner of the company that he owed money to called him and canceled his debt. He said, you don't have to pay any of that money. And the, the man who received it was like, wait, why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? And the owner of the company that he, he owed money to said, I'm a Christian and, and forgiving get debts is a part of what we do. And, and, and so I wanted to do that for you. And what's remarkable about that story is that the man who received the forgiveness of debt actually had just recently become a Christian. And just a couple months into becoming a Christian, he saw firsthand what it looked like to do business, to, to work in your job in a way that, that served the mission of the kingdom, sacrificially. Because the, the, the man who offered the forgiveness, he suffered great loss. That was a risk. It was a risk. But it's an example of conducting your work, conducting your work for the king. 
conducting your work for the king. So the question that I want to ask us to close is this. Is where are you playing it safe with Jesus? Where are you playing it safe with Jesus? How are you putting Jesus in a handkerchief and stopping him away? Is it in your association with him? Is it if, with your, the stewardship of your gifts? Is it with the way that you work that might not be in line with the, the values of his kingdom? Where are you playing it safe? Jean Twinge, in her fascinating book, iGen, about the generations that have grown up with technology, discusses how we're raising generations that are increasingly focused on safety and averse to taking risks. Here's what she says. She says, wanting to feel safe all of the time can also lead to wanting to protect against any emotional upset. The concern with emotional safety is is somewhat unique to, to iGen. That can include preventing bad experiences or sidestepping situations that might be uncomfortable, avoiding people with different ideas from your own. We become more and more fascinated with safety as a culture to the exclusion of taking risks. And the same thing is becoming increasingly true uh, with the Western church as well. We know other churches around the world that taking a risk comes part and parcel with being a Christian. And while we want to be safe as a church in terms of not abusing power and a safe place for people to come and find healing and not feel feel judged or condemned, we don't want to become the kind of safe place in the sense of becoming so comfortable that you don't take many risks for the mission of Jesus. So where are you this morning playing it safe with Jesus? What has caused you to delay in getting on with the king's business? And where I want to push us as we close in, in challenging us is, is from this point of, of, of just honestly about myself, one of the reasons that I delay the most in doing what God is calling me to do is that I want to have all the information first. Is anyone else with me there? I want to do everything perfectly right away. I want to have all the information so I can make the best decision and the most calculated choice possible. And often if I can't do it perfectly the first time, I just don't do anything at all. Read all the books, watch all the things, figure out how to do it the best. But friends, discipleship doesn't work that way. Being under the reign of King Jesus doesn't work that way. Discipleship can't wait for us to figure out the best possible option and maximize it to the best of its ability, to take in all the information and make the safest possible decision with the least amount of risk. Friends, discipleship is a series of simple steps of risky obedience. Discipleship is doing the next thing necessary to seek God more deeply. So what is the next necessary risk Jesus is asking you to take while he is away? Don't try to do all of it. But life in the kingdom is risky business. Risk inevitably opens us up to hurt and loss. It opens up the potential for failure. But friends, the reward we anticipate and the grace of our king is powerful enough to cover every mistake for those who live under his rule. It is this king who gave himself for us when he made his way to Jerusalem. So to live for him, even when it comes with risks, is always going to be worth it. Let's pray. Father, we don't want a comfortable, safe life. There are parts of us that do, but God, would you rid those out when they come in opposition with your kingdom? Lord, help us to see where you are calling us to take risks for the mission of your kingdom. Help us to see where we're we're hesitant to associate our life with you for fear of condemnation or, or judgment or feeling foolish if it didn't come to be true. Lord, help us to conduct our work in a way that is for you as our king and your mission. And God, help us to see our gifts and how we can steward those for the the good of those around us in your church and for the good of the world. That we, we aren't just seeing our work and our gifts as a way of getting compensation, but of contributing to the flourishing of human creation. And God, we long for the day when you will come back and reward us. And we pray that on that day, you would say to us, because of our simple steps of risky obedience. Well done, good and faithful servants. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, by the power of His Spirit. Amen. Well, every week here at the Brookside campus, we we respond to the teaching of Jesus by participating in the Lord's Supper. 
And when we do that, we're, we're reminding ourselves that Jesus is the true and better nobleman, the true and better king who's, who's been so generous to us and even giving his blood. He's been declared the king of the kingdom of God and not through the pageantry of royal coronation or de- defeating a dragon or military conquest. No, he was crowned on a cross and conquered through being conquered. As we eat the body and drink the blood, we remember that he endured all our costs of sin so that we might receive all his blessings in the life of his kingdom and the reward that is coming for us and that is even here today. So if you have communion elements, if you're a follower of Jesus, this would be a great time to do it. And and feel free to pause the video, take as much time as you need. So I deliver to you what I also received, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And after blessing it, he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after blessing it, he gave it to them and said, drink of this, all of you. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Truly, I tell you, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, the King's death, until he comes. Well, as we go now uh, to the places where God has called us to, to live lives associated with him and stewarding the gifts of his kingdom and conducting work on behalf of our king, would you hear these words of benediction? Wherever you are, I, I invite you to raise your hand as a sign that you're receiving this good word. This benediction comes from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 19, and it's Jesus' response to, to Peter who, who says, we've risked everything to follow you. Will we have a reward? You'll notice that Jesus doesn't condemn him for asking that question, but rather affirms the reward of those who have faithfully followed him. So so hear these words. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne as king, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Go in peace with the, the anticipation of that great reward and have a great week.